Um, my name is Bridget Barry and welcome to the Ask a Farmer Q&A session with Farming for Nature. Farming for Nature was set up to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more for nature. And one of the ways we do this is finding each year exemplary farmers that are practicing their farming methods alongside uh, nature. This Q&A is a great way to hear from these ambassadors uh, and learn more about their farming practices. So uh, tonight's session, I'll kickstart with a few questions and then I encourage any of you that want to ask the Call to Pots a question um, to write into the chat box and I'll facilitate that. Um, if you miss any of tonight's session, uh, it will be available up on our YouTube channel tomorrow and feel free to share it with anyone else who is unable to make it um, tonight as well. So on to tonight's session. Uh, we are delighted to welcome Farming for Nature ambassadors, uh, Rod and Julie Calderpot. Um, they both run a 55-acre farm in uh, County Kilkenny, an organic orchard. Um, so Rod and Julie, hi, thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, it's great to profile a farm like yours, uh, an orchard, because uh, an organic orchard, because I suppose there's very few in Ireland at your scale and at your scale working alongside nature. So uh, thanks for joining us. I'm going to have to admit I'm a bit of a layman when it comes to growing fruit. So forgive me if I don't understand any of the terms and stuff, but uh, but we'll uh, we'll get on to that. Before we get started, perhaps you might set the scene for us, those of us who haven't visited your farm, what the farm looks like and explain your farming system. Yeah, sure. Um... We've got a 55 acre farm here. It's an old family farm, belonged to my great grandfather. Um, we uh, took it, my parents came here uh, in the 60s and they grew hops here, they grew apples and uh, they farmed very, very intensively. <clears throat> they, at that time in the 60s and shortly after the war, I suppose, um, People believed in chemical farming. We believed in chemical farming. We felt that um, we were very naive. We felt that farming would solve all our problems, that chemicals were uh, uh, the silver bullet. It would get rid of the few pests that we had. Um, we didn't realize that the profound effect that even putting one spray onto a crop has on nature. I don't suppose we understood the real and critical nature of the um, symbiosis of nature and natural organisms that is farming. Um, we, my parents then uh, sold the hop farm off in the uh, late 70s and then <coughs> they, I took over the farm in 1979. Uh, at that time there were 55 acres of eating apples there. We we're producing about 600 tons, mostly called delicious. We were spraying the orchard uh, for pests and just uh, to make it clear to people what pests were considered to be. Uh, pests were uh, malign fungi, uh, malign um, birds and malign insects. Um, and uh, we naively thought at that time that you could spray an insecticide that wouldn't affect birds or wouldn't in fact affect um, fungi or um, any of the microorganisms in the soil or in, in the air. Um, <clears throat> we uh, then decided in 1980, uh, uh, I married this gorgeous girl here mm -hmm. in uh, 1983, and uh, we decided to, uh, to go completely chemical free uh, after getting an awful fright with uh, a very near agrochemical um, catastrophe in 1986. We banned chemicals uh, from the farm and we decided that uh, sink or swim, uh, we were going to do without chemicals from then on. Uh, I suppose that now in hindsight, I wasn't, I wasn't really au fait with the uh, kind of um, modern farming for nature speak uh, at that time. But I suppose we, we entered what you would now call a regenerative phase at that stage. Uh, there are very few birds in the trees on the farm. They, I mean, birds need habitat and food, as simple as that. And uh, they, they had neither. Uh, we had very few, uh, the farm was uh, edge to edge apples. So we had, uh, and the soil was dead. Uh, 
during the time that we had the chemical apples there, chemically farmed apples, we sprayed. Sometimes when the weather was very wet and we were trying to get a good control over apple scab, sometimes we'd spray every four or five days. Uh, enormous chemical bill, all the money going to the awful pharmaceutical chemical companies. And also I was naive enough to actually believe what uh, pharmaceutical, the big pharma companies were telling me. For instance, when I, when I got an insecticide and I asked them, was this going to affect bees? They'd say, oh, no, 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 no. This is very targeted, which of course I know now was utterly bollocks. I mean, tea, you know, um, uh, what uh, DDT, <laughs> is kills everything, including yourself. You know? mm -hmm. So um, we naively then uh, planted our trees uh, at the beginning of this regenerative phase, if you like. Uh, the trees did very badly because, as you probably know, um, the philosophy of growing with chemicals and growing organically or growing without chemicals are completely and utterly different. There is absolutely, they have nothing in common. If you are a chemical farmer and you decide to go organic, just forget everything you've ever heard. Uh, the organic advi the advisors around here uh, only advise you about chemical farming. I haven't had a chemist advisor uh, on the farm for 15 years, despite the fact that I pay them every year, <laughs> because uh, they, they realize that they know nothing about organic farming of fruit. Uh, we were determined that the farm would heal itself, as I say, the first year the apples had hardly any leaves, uh, but very slowly, slowly, um, the, I realize now, or I assume now, because the, the longer I go into this game, uh, the more modest I get, because the more I realize that I didn't understand, and we don't understand how, how, how nature works. You know, we don't understand every, every nut and bolt. And I think any academic or any chemical person who tells you they do is guilty of, of hubris in, in the worst sense of it. Anyway, slowly things came right, you know. Uh, the apple trees grew a lot slower. We, we were in a tranche of, of growers who joined um, uh, putting in 20 acre tranches of, of apples, mainly for supplying to Bulmers initially. Um, and the, the chemical farmers who were pumping nitrogen onto their fields and onto their trees and so on, uh, their trees grew. I got very jealous. Their trees were growing very strongly and uh, they very quickly got into um, uh, a, a decent commercial crops. My trees grew slowly. Uh, they didn't cost me anything because all I had to do was mow the lawn and, and mow the grass between them and, uh, and, and prune them and pick the apples. Uh, disappointingly few apples uh, there, there were for the first, for the first few years. Uh, there were things though, uh, slowly the, the, the disease became less. Um, and I, I, I attribute this in, in my naivety, I attribute this to the fact that uh, every single organism in the world has a predator. You know, even an elephant uh, has a predator. He's got, a, he's got a mind up for something. And you cannot have the predator in the field without having the disease. So even disease is about predators. And so by having the disease in the field during those regenerative years, um, the disease is predators, if you like. The competition for that disease built up to such an extent that, um, that the disease didn't have much of a foothold at all. And, uh, and has very little effect. Now, when we did plant the, uh, the 20 acres trees uh, for Bulmers, if you like, although we knew that in the long term they wouldn't be for Bulmers because Bulmers weren't prepared to pay us any extra for organic fruit. Um, we, uh, we reckoned that we'd, we'd go for a processing apple because I realized from my um, long experience of chemical farming uh, of dessert apples, that customers buy apples, fresh apples, dessert apples, they buy them by eye. Uh, they, they will not buy a, an apple that isn't pretty. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you cannot educate people. You've got to give them what they want. There's no point trying to change people's opinions, particularly that one. Even the most ardent uh, organic person will reach out for a beautiful unblemished apple. And that is the apple that will be covered in chemicals. <clears throat> so um, we started sending our, our apples to Bulmers in the initial phases. Um, and uh, Julie, this gorgeous girl sitting beside me here, uh, she started trying to um, find alternative uses for the apples that would yield more cash. Uh, we had the, the basic there in those days that Bulmers were prepared to give us 150 pounds uh, a ton for, um, for apples. And so initially Julie started with, um, with just making apple juice, which everybody starts with. And uh, then um, she was fiddling around with the apple juice uh, and uh, put some in a pot and started trying to boil it up and see if she could make, I think she was thinking of uh, chai baby. chip baby food at the time. And then she stumbled on this lovely, that, that these particular apples of ours, that she was playing with at the time, um, made a, 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 when they evaporated down, well, she had them in the pot and the phone went and she went to talk on the phone. And the one, one of the things she's really great at is talking on the phone. Uh, so after she'd been chatting for about a half an hour, went back to the pot, it was almost dry, and she found it had this lovely syrup in it. So we developed the syrup and then one thing led to another. So the, as the, it, I suppose it was sort of fortuitous and serendipitous or whatever you'd call it, that as the yield grew up, so uh, did our market. So uh, we've developed over the time, we've developed um, apple juice, apple syrup. We then for, just had another mistake and we burnt the apple syrup. And we found that we had a beautiful a caramelized apple, which we call apple treacle, a caramelized apple syrup, which we call apple treacle. We then put in our, our own press because we, in the initial phase, we got Con, my good friend Con Trash in the apple farm down in Tipperary. Uh, and Con was juicing them for us and bottling them for us and so on. Uh, but then uh, we put in our own press and we can now press all our own stuff. And we still get Con to to do anything, bottling that needs pasteurizing, but everything else we do ourselves. We put in a little distillery. So, and we've also uh, put in a good, uh, a big vinegar fermenter, so we can ferment uh, vinegar. And the beauty of this that, we, that has made us kind of unapproachable, we, we have, we've yet to find anybody who is growing apples on the scale that we're growing them. You know, we're, we're now sort of approaching 200 tons a year from our 20 acres, which we're very happy with 10 tons to the acre. Uh, but there's, ev everybody uses a chemical. Um, even the organic farmers, they either use a chemical or they grow them in a place where they don't need to use chemicals, but they're still using insecticides. I mean, a lot of the organic apples are grown in the state, dry states in America where uh, with irrigation, um, but by using a chemical at all, you dis disrupt the microbial life in the orchard. And that has profound effects downstream when you start processing your apples. So uh, the, way, uh, the way apples are normally processed is they juice the apples and then they, they sterilize, sterilize the apples with, sul with sulfur dioxide. And then they chuck in uh, a laboratory isolated yeast. Now, there are thousands of different yeasts, but any cider you drink, apart from ours, and any vinegar that you take is made from, the ciders are made from just one laboratory isolated yeast micro. And then if they go on to make it into a vinegar, they use one laboratory isolated acetobacter to convert it from cider to vinegar. Well, we don't do any of that because the, uh, the microbial uh, community, if you like, in our orchard is so well established and so settled that we know that it will, uh, if we juice our apples and then put it into a barrel, we just leave it and it will turn into, um, into a good cider. Now, initially we thought 
we thought that this wouldn't mightn't happen all the time because we're organic organic and we're flaky and mad but uh, so we 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 put our um, our cider into small barrels of just a thousand liters so that if one went wrong the it, it wouldn't it wouldn't affect us too much we've never ever ever had a failed we've never had a failed uh, cider fermentation and that's just the the thousands of wild uh, um, uh, yeast that we have in the orchard. Then when we take it on and we put it into the digester, which is where the acetobacter, bacteria, uh, which has been sitting in the cider all along, but needs oxygen to work its magic. Um, when we put the cider into the, the tank and blow bubbles through it, that acetobacter is awakened and activated and we get excellent vinegar every single time. So nature ain't broken, you know, and the problem, I think, where we went wrong, we backed off after the war when we went away from organic farming and struggled trying to, um, trying to fix nature with chemicals. Uh, we went down a path which, is, uh, with, which we are going to have to withdraw from, and we're going to have to go through some kind of regeneration. And I'm not going to tell people, beef farmers, how they're going to do it, or uh, tillage farmers, how they're going to do it. Our, ex our experience with, with tillage is actually very, very small. We have 17 acres of, of oats, uh, and we don't uh, we don't use any chemicals, um, and we don't even use fertilizer. So, so Rod, how do you feed your soil? How do you improve your soil fertility after each harvest? What you do you do to your soil? You don't need to. Okay. Um, I met uh, I met some. Um, some Japanese um, monks called Shumai came to see me. Now I was putting on um, cheese sludge onto the soil and uh, getting it for oh, free no. from Belly Ragged. It's a byproduct which is organically acceptable. And I was putting on about 70 or 80 tons a year. And um, the, my Japanese friends came, came to, uh, to see me and uh, they asked if they could adopt the orchard. And I was very touched. I didn't know nothing about Buddhists. And uh, they, they, they're they kind of evangelizing uh, natural farming. They call it Shumai Natural Farming. And they have various places around the world which are funded from Kyoto, from the central as head office there. And they said, well, I said to them, well, I'm very touched. And it goes completely. It, well, they, they said they would like me to stop putting cheese sludge on the orchard. Any fertilizer. Any fertilizer at all. They didn't want me to put anything in. And I said to them, look, I'm very touched you guys were coming, but it's completely counterintuitive. It, I've always been told, if you take something out of the orchard, you've got to replace it. And they said, no, that's not how nature works. And uh, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll try it on a section of the orchard. So I happen to have two sections of the orchard that are about 100 yards apart, which are identical in every way. So one of them, I decided not to feed at all. And the other one, I continued to put cheese sludge in. And within about two years, the difference was astounding. The part that I hadn't fed was vastly superior to the part that I'd been feeding. Now, I've been trying, I've been trying to understand this and I think it's because when you feed uh, an orchard, you see an orchard is a very, very long-term thing and the apple trees are in the ground for, so, you know, for 50, 100 years. When you feed an orchard, you're expecting the roots to come up to the surface uh, to get the, the food. Whereas in fact, what's on the surface are, is the substrate. Now, I think the substrate is incredibly important but it is competition for the trees. So what I was getting was fabulous grass and you know the, the rye grass and things like that were doing incredibly well. But uh, that's not what I'm growing. These grasses and things were competing with the fruit trees for moisture and so on. Uh, and there, there, there are actually plenty of minerals, particularly in this wonderful Kilkenny soil that I have that's very, very deep and very rich. There are plenty of chemicals. You don't need to give the plant any okay. chemicals. The only thing really it needs is nitrogen. So what actually happened uh, was that the grasses died down because they were no longer being fed 
and they had a problem. And they were replaced by uh, legumes. So I was getting a huge number of clover, amount of clover growing in these rows that I, that I wasn't uh, And of course, they were feeding the apple tree with all the nitrogen needed. So we we're getting a really beautiful symbiosis mm -hmm. um, where we thought we were doing a great thing. By so the, really what I've discovered, what we have discovered is that um, often less is more with organic farming. And for your apple trees, have you added kind of pollinator strips or anything to kind of encourage more pollinators to the area or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I, th I, th I, th I think pollination is very important, um, very, very important, obviously. Uh, uh, Rod, will you do me a favour? Uh, Rod, Rod, sorry. Rod, can you turn off your video just because it's using up the broadband and I'll turn off mine? Sorry, it's just a both of us okay. keep skipping. Yeah, it's probably my end anyway. How's that? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, keep going. Sorry, um, <clears throat> you were just saying about pollinator strips. Oh yeah, well we're lucky. We have a lot of dandelions, and it works very well for us because uh, our neighbours, who are all great friends of mine, but from the point of view of organics, they're total philistines. Uh, they grow a lot of uh, oilseed rape around me. Um, so my uh, my bee my honeybees tend to migrate over to the uh, uh, to to uh, to the oilseed rape because the oilseed rape flowers before the uh, the apples do and uh, the flowering just goes on forever. Mm. Um, so we are trying to uh, support because honeybees, of course, we have a very good apiary on the farm. In fact, we won the prize for the best honey in the world in the London Honey Show um, mm. uh, a couple of years ago. But I honestly don't think the, the honeybees do me any good because they, they fix onto the oilseed rape. And we, you see, they fly a vast distances uh, in order to get, to get their, their target. And then uh, it's very hard, almost impossible to get them off that once they're fixed on it. So we've concentrated on trying to support uh, solitary bees. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, uh, we, we, we found that we've got a, a really good, you'd hardly call it a, colon, a colony of solitary bees, that'd be an oxymoron. Yeah. But there are lots and lots of, uh, of uh, red, um, no, red mason bees here in the, uh, in, in the farmyard. They're li living in the, in, in, the, in the mortar of some very old buildings that we have here. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, uh, left a lot of uh, bamboo uh, cuttings, little sort of six inch lengths of bamboo and, uh, and also cardboard sort of uh, bee hotels, if you like. And the, um, the, the, uh, the solitary bees have, uh, have laid their eggs in that. Then we've taken them out in the orchard and we've strapped them to the branches of the trees. And what they need is habitat. The beauty of these solitary bees, and I think most solitary, I'm not an expert on bees, is that they don't, they're loyal. Often a solitary bee will live just for one tree. Uh, and it, it, they, they don't move more than 30 meters. You know, 30 meters is only 100 foot. Uh, and they will hatch when that tree flowers and so on. So they have a real bond. They really are part of a, of a very small community. Of your ecosystem. I know you've added like two lakes and some forestry. I mean, do you see nature responding to these? Has it taken up space from your product really? Or do you think it's added value to it? No, I think the general wisdom seems to be that you should have at least 10% of your farm under biodiversity, right? Now, I reckon I have 100% of my farm in biodiversity because the substrate under the apple is, uh, is tremendously biodiverse as well. And it takes up, you know, 100% of the orchard. But you don't understand nature. And so um, if, you don't, if you don't understand it, uh, then the best thing is to leave it alone. Now, we didn't have a lot of water on the farm. There's a little stream at one end, which was actually belonged to my neighbor, but I managed to get him persuaded to sell it to me. I don't know how we managed that, but we... So we now have about 200, acre, 200 meters of, no, 400 meters of stream running mm -hmm. along one of our boundaries. And when we bought it, we bought right 
to the other side of the screen. So we own both sides of it. I insisted on that because it's a very important badger set and um, a fox is covered on that side. Uh, then we put in two lakes uh, over the last sort of, what, 20 years? We, yeah, 30 years, yeah. <laughs> You see, this has been a journey Julia and I have been on for, for 40 years since we, yeah. since we met. And uh, this, there's no plan. It's very ad hoc. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting, though, because it sounds like it's, you know, it, it's been, you know, listening to your story and journey, it's a massive change. You've moved away a lot from maybe what your neighbours have been up to. And I suppose, you know, is that kind of, was that daunting to kind of take such a pivot um, away from the conventional or, you know, once you started to see the rewards to your product, did it make sense? Well, I think it was kind of bold. Um, we, we were lucky in that we were, we had another business. We, I don't know if most organic farmers probably know us from our tunnels. We were selling greenhouses around the country. So mm. we weren't hugely dependent on the, on the farm. We, we could make a few mistakes. Uh, we, you know, uh, without starving. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we decided to go down this. Uh, I'll tell you what the alternative was. Uh, the alternative to, um, to giving up chemicals was to sell the farm. There was, mm -hmm. there was no other alternative. Chemicals are just not an option with us. Mm. But it's interesting also that kind of, that you did diversify, not just within your business for your kind of amongst your apples, but, you know, as uh, you, you've also diversified in business as well. Uh, on your farm yeah. so you've made yeah. quite a productive farm out of 55 acres yeah well that's great you're Julie's best to talk about that uh, I'll pass you over to her and she'll talk about that diversification I think with um, small farmers and we get a lot of guests here we have tourism on the farm pre-covid uh, I would say small farmers need to add, add value to what they're doing to actually survive Mm. be it whatever they're, they're doing, um, particularly with the biodiversity um, angles. And uh, what we were looking at is to actually add that value and also sell direct mm. um, so that we could maximise our margins initially. We don't sell everything direct now, but uh, that was what we were looking at doing. And I, I would say to everyone out there who's, who's looking at this, that those two items are very important, but there is another one that I think is very important, and that's to share, to actually join with other people who are doing the same thing or perhaps complement you so that you can market together and move together because mm. it is a lonely path if you don't. And it's um, quite labour intensive going all the way to market. I exactly, assume. exactly, yeah. exactly. What do you think, Julie, is the biggest challenge for small scale organic producers? Or what have you found the biggest challenge for yourself in business? Um, I think the challenges have got less because people understand um, where they're to buy local, uh, to support locally, and uh, to support a good quality food for their for themselves and their families. And I think there's a tremendous knowledge out there that wasn't there 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what is the biggest challenge would be to grow slowly and get your profit margins there. But we do have tremendous supports now too with our Leos and leaders and things, and people who want to support you uh, if you access uh, access uh, those. That things. was actually going to be my next question. Like, where would you go for advice and support? Or, you know, is there online troubleshooting for, for kind of small scale producers? And Yes, uh, well, Leo is excellent because they have a start your own business thing. But farming for nature is quite a good one. Oh, should they're grand. <laughs> <laughs> no, but chatting is mm. so important. And mm. uh, as I say, linking the markets, uh, leader has uh, money to help you uh, mm. for marketing to do on farm. And actually the Department of Ag as well is brilliant. Mm. Brilliant. The organic sector in Johnstown Castle um, is offering tremendous grants there to um, do on farm um, developments. And what would you, what would you be your kind of Three top tips, I'd say, for any farmer that's interested in, say, starting up a business alongside fruit and going through to the final product. I mean, is there any kind of top tips that you would give for that? Someone that's listening tonight that is thinking of working with fruit, but taking it to the final product. Don't sell too cheap. And do smaller quantity with a higher, higher margin would be one, would that be? Sell 
What would you think about that? Uh, yeah, the, the one thing farmers do in this country is they compete mm -hmm. with each other, uh, mm -hmm. and they just uh, compete to go down, uh, down in price. And uh, you'd be amazed at, at how much of a margin you really do need. You know, and if you don't fund yourself properly. And you don't get a decent price for your product. And as well as that, the people you sell to try and talk you down and try and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and stop you from um, stop you from getting a decent margin for yourself, so that you can have a life and uh, and run your business and invest. You know, mm -hmm. I join up with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love a story. Of, um, Fergal Quinn was uh, approached by somebody who told him that he could. Uh, he could make cider for a, a euro a litre. And would Fergal be interested in selling it in his supermarkets? And Fergal said, absolutely not. He said, I do not want people who want cider for a pound a litre in my shops. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, just moving over to the chat box here, uh, Linda uh, Gilsonen has asked, I absolutely love hearing this. I have a tiny eight-year-old organic orchard of just 15 trees, but want to plant more. Can I ask what rootstock and what varieties of apples and do they graft themselves? Also, how do they manage the growth under the tree? How do you guys manage the growth under the tree? Uh, we'll just start with those questions first and then we'll move on to okay. the next one. Well, um, I, I don't know. It, it, the, the rootstock, you want to get them all in rootstock because they're, they're bred in East Malling in, in, in England. Uh, and but they they the various dwarfing rootstocks that were designed uh, very cleverly to resist certain insect, mainly um, woolly aphid. Uh, and which rootstock you use, you get the advice of of other people than me. I used got somebody's advice. I can't even remember which rootstocks I used. But it it all depends on how big a tree you want, because rootstocks can be very dwarfing. Or, or slightly dwarfing. And then if they are, you can have the tree is very weak and won't stand up by itself. Mm -hmm. um, varieties, I would strongly recommend that you get good, strong commercial varieties. Uh, don't, uh, don't go for heritage varieties. Um, the reason they're only heritage varieties is because they're not commercial. A commercial variety is disease resistant, it's high yielding, it tastes good and so on. The other bit of advice I would say is don't plant too many varieties because mm. you wouldn't know what to do with them. I mean, for example, we make vinegar from one variety of apple. We make our syrup from another variety of apple. We make our cider from, an, from another variety. You've got to have enough of those varieties to, to fulfill that duty. Do you know what I mean? So I see uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a company in England who have copied almost everything we do. But uh, they they have about a million different varieties, and how can they possibly get any kind of unif uniformity of flavor mm. or anything? Even you know how can they do anything with you know fifty or sixty different varieties of mm. apple? So do focus, get advice, decide more or less what you're going to do, and what sort of flavors you want. Now in our case, it, we we didn't do that. But the one thing we did do is we, we only got about three or four varieties. Mm. But we, we didn't really know what we were going to do with them <laughs> because we were going down uncharted water. And so we actually found a use for the variety rather than a variety for the yeah. use of the what's, I, your, I, what's your favorite variety of eating apple? Of eating apple? Uh, well, this is what oh, Linda is asking. Everybody. I remember I was talking to him when I was a student in, in Trinity. My landlady reckoned that her favorite variety was laxatives, no, laxatives superb. Good God. <laughs> yeah, the laxatives superb. No, it's lovely. It's sparkling. Yeah. It's lovely. You get sick of one, you know, if, you, if you're yeah. just eating an apple. Yeah. You get sick of one. But what I would always say is plant a James Greve. James Greaves are great. Plant a, a few Bramleys. Bramleys are great, but they're, they're just a ball of acid like that. But they're ideal for pies and, you mm. know, if you're going for a, a, a baby food or something like that, you know. And finally, um, Linda, I, 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 I would say very strongly as well, we need more soft fruit in Ireland. There is a huge amount of jam being made, mostly on imports. What's wrong with gooseberries, raspberries, black currants, you know, uh, pear trees, apple trees, uh, are some of the uh, lots of apple trees. What about plums? Mm. You know, 
Um, and I do feel there's a, a large market there that we haven't tapped, really. Mm, definitely. Um, how do you manage your growth under the trees, Linda, also finally wants to well, know? Yeah, the growth under the trees is what I called earlier the substrate, you know. Um, what I would do, if you're planting apple trees, I would try and just um, go through the regeneration process a bit quicker by planting some, um, uh, so, some clover, you know, some white clover to get it sort of in there first so it gets a good strong take. And then I wouldn't plant anything else. I'd let whatever's coming come, fight its little battle and either succeed or fail. Uh, and it'll have to succeed with your process. I, I mow the, the substrate. Uh, I mow it carefully at the beginning of the year when the, the um, uh, uh, what, what do you call the flowers that come first? Dandelions. When the dandelions come, mm -hmm. we leave the dandelions to flower. Mm -hmm. And just when the apples start to flower, we, we cut the dandelions, we mow them out just to get the bees to pay attention. Focus, yeah. <laughs> know what you're at, need them yeah, to it. No, there's no, there's no other thing to do, only to, to mow. Mm. And remember with, with this sort of biodiversity and with the balance and symbiosis in an orchard, there can never be a moment when you'd say, that's it, it's perfect, hold, we stop there. Mm. Because everything changes, even walking through the orchard, in a, in, a, in a certain way, it's going to change what grows in your path. And uh, even a wet winter or a dry summer is going to change and going to be good for some plants. I don't remember about five or six years ago, there was a really, really wet spring and we got a huge amount of cow parsley. And it stayed for years and now it's sort of fading back again. So you get these waves and changes that happen. Mm, yeah, true. <laughs> environmentally based. Uh, Dan MacArthur says, uh, breath of fresh air to listen to you both. I have 12 apple trees and I don't get these perfect apples that come from Chile or the US. I put horse manure and organic chicken pellets around each tree, but I agree with you, there should be no need as the roots go deep and get what they need from the ground. Um, Donald Chambers has said, so did the pest pressure just decrease over the years as biodiversity returned to the farm and disease is now not an issue? Yeah. Um the pests, uh, an interesting thing happened to us now. I went out uh, one year and just noticed there was a huge, or at least a lot, of caterpillars. And I didn't know what they were. Now, in my chemical days, I'd have gone with a knee-jerk reaction and uh, rushed into Kilkenny and bought myself some insecticide and come and done huge damage by, by killing everything in the orchard. Uh, we don't have that, um, that gun in our armory anymore. So all we can do is watch. Mm. So we stayed and watched and we discovered that this little caterpillar was, uh, was a, a little apple ermine uh, moth. Uh, and under pressure, it's, it's an endangered species. It's doing really well here at High Bank. <laughs> uh, and it, it eventually went and uh, obviously uh, um, formed itself into a chrysalis uh, in a little web, and then the, um, they were discovered by the earwigs. The earwigs started munching away and ate them to such an extent that I thought, my goodness, and I, are they going to be enough to, to lay some eggs for next year? So every year now, I look forward to the little apple ermine moth. He eats a few leaves. Um, by the end of July, you wouldn't even know where he'd been, you know? Mm. He, he grows it, he hatches into a lovely little moth. Uh, and then they go off. So after this episode, this spring episode, we're left with some lovely fat earwigs who are going around do, doing their stuff and food for the birds and you know being part of the of the symbiosis. And uh, we've we've had this lovely experience with the little Aplomai moth. So the only thing that the only pest uh, insect pest that I'm worried about is the coddling moth. Uh, he, he's he's not really he's not really doing enough damage to me now. But if you had an eating apple, if if we were trying to sell the apples for eating, you know he's the guy who makes a hole in the apple and goes in and sort of messes mm -hmm. around in the apple. Now it doesn't really matter to me because I'm selling all my apples as juice anyway. But uh, there is a thing you can do there. But I worry about how disruptive it is. <coughs> You can you can put on a 
uh, a, a smell. What do you call it? Um, mm -hmm. An S? No. No, it's, no. A, it's, a, it's a smell. <coughs> it's a powder which is uh, got a scent on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it mimics the, the mating scent of the um, a pheromone. Yeah. Pheromone, exactly the word I was looking for, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you leave the pheromone there, a, a lot of it, and all the males hop into this pheromone and they come out smelling like ladies and they start jumping on each other. <laughs> and it's so effective that you only need to do it once every five years. Mm. But, uh, and it doesn't, I don't think on the face of it, it affects anything else. So if I do get a, a problem with um, uh, uh, with with uh, with those, I'll, I'll, I think I will try the pheromone traps. I know you recently added a distillery to your <clears throat> to your your book of wonders, and so you got vodka and, and various other things. Like looking back at the amount that you've diversified since, I suppose since the seventy nine or whenever you took on the farm, uh, how does it make you feel? What what the journey you've been on? And where you where you now are? Well, I think um, you know. The, I think most farmers. I've yet to meet a farmer who didn't absolutely love his farm. Uh -huh. uh, we love our farm. We love being here. We love living here, mm -hmm. and uh, it is it is wonderful that we've actually found uh, a, a use for it, which is you know, which is positive and. Uh, a, a, a lot of a lot of um, <clears throat> sort of chemical for non-organic farms, I say, not to be too insulting to them. Uh, I find that they understand absolutely what we're doing, and they wish they could do it. I think that's why you guys in mm. farming for nature are are doing a great thing because you, you've kind of given us a license to go out and talk to these people. Mm. And uh, and not be afraid and encourage them, yeah. And so instead of looking over the fence and saying, "What are these crazy people doing?" You know, they, you know, they come and talk to me, and uh, we can talk to them without without being critical of them because the farmers are great. You know, I, I think just the whole farming movement has gone down the wrong road, and mm -hmm. we were part of it when it happened. It's just very very hard to turn back. Mm -hmm. That regenerative phase is terribly difficult. You know. I think it's interesting the amount of people we speak to through these events and stuff that go, I just want to farm like my grandfather, not like my father, because I think you're right. There's kind of a whole section there, quite a few decades where everyone was led by the hand down a certain route. And now it's kind of questioning the long term value of that, obviously. Um, and I think also what's really important about your farm is diversity. You know, there's you've really kind of showcased diversity like equals resilience and diversity obviously of business but also sounds like diversity of apples but and products but also you know of customer as well so I mean that's kudos to you guys for for doing that and and sharing it as well and inspiring other people as well to do that so thanks for that we have actually come to nine o'clock. I know we started quite late, um, but it's been really nice speaking to you both, Julie and Rod. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and it's really inspiring to hear what you have achieved and how you've achieved it. And, you know, it, it's very encouraging as, as someone's written here. Um, wonderful talk. I've learned so much and feel very encouraged. We'll plan an orchard extension for next spring and hope to visit your farm too. And uh, thank you for your generosity and sharing. And on that, actually, I suppose we, Farming for Nature would hope um, over the summer to have a farm walk on Rod and Judy's farm. So keep an eye on our newsletter, subscribe to our newsletter through our homepage, um, and you'll keep up to date on our series of walks that we'll be coming up with our Farming for Nature ambassadors throughout the summer between May and October. We hope to have, um, well, last year, you know, we had about 30 walks. So do keep an eye on them. Um, if you missed any part of this talk or you think anyone else would like to hear it, it will be up on our YouTube channel um, tomorrow. Um, if anyone would like to contact um, Rod and Julie direct, um, High Bank Farm is online and they also, uh, uh, you can follow them on different social media um, tags and stuff, the, the, the usual. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions for any of our farmers, we have an online forum, so don't hesitate to, to click onto that. Thank you so much, um, Rod and Julie.
for joining us tonight. Um, and our next talk is in two weeks' time with uh, Pat Lawler, who is a beef, organic beef and cereal farmer. He makes Kilbega notes up there in County Westmeath. Um, Julie, Rod, thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.